Um, so our journey started way back in 2004 when my daughter, who was then 19, was diagnosed with a grade two glioma. And we kind of, she was just off to university and that's what she wanted to focus on. Um, and we were, we just felt absolutely lost. We weren't even given a follow-up appointment, just told that she had this brain tumor and they were really focused on trying to get her epilepsy under control. Um, and then after 18 months, I thought, no, there's got to be more out there than, than this. Um, and it was just serendipity that we were put in touch with a neurosurgeon in Boston who was Peter Black. And eventually, two years down the line, she flew out and she had um, surgery with him. Um, she, she was meant to be at the Brigham and Women's, but then ended up at the Children's Hospital because the intraoperative MRI scanner crashed. And it wasn't until we spoke to Peter Black that he said actually grade two tumours always will transform to a higher grade. And I felt I felt really angry that nobody in the UK had shared that information with us because I didn't feel it was right that a consultant neurosurgeon who was actually a professor of neurosurgery should gatekeep that information or even as a professor of neurosurgery if he didn't know then I felt he should have told us because it would have changed the, completely the way we were looking at our daughter's tumour and then 18 months after she was diagnosed I was diagnosed with head and neck cancer so I've had surgery and radiotherapy but we're both survivors and she's got two two lovely uh, daughters now um, so it was out of this experience that we founded Brains Trust because we didn't want people to feel as lost as we did the day we were told Meg had a brain tumour. Um, and our whole ethos is based on coaching, which I'll talk a little bit more about in, in a moment. And it's, it's also working with the NHS, which has a very patriarchal um, culture, you know, that people go to a GP or a doctor expecting to be fixed. And it took me a year with my daughter to realize that actually they couldn't fix her because they didn't have the answers. And as soon as I stepped out of that, here's my daughter, please mend her, things, the conversation suddenly freed up and we found that we were working much more closely with her clinical team. So we've set up Brains Trust and it's always trying to support patients and caregivers, no matter what their diagnosis is, you know, whether it's a brain metastasis, whether it's a glioblastoma, whether it's a, mini, a um, non-malignant meningioma, um, trying to get people to work together so that they are always regarded first as a person um, and not as a patient. Because I think it's very easy to slip into that role as a patient. Um, and then you tend to become passive recipients um, and feel less resourced and less resilient than if you're treated as a person. So I, I won't show you the video. So this is typically the sort of um, person that we'll work with. This is a case I've been working on uh, recently and you'll, you, you know, you may have some resonance with, with Andrew. He's a, a carpenter. Uh, so Helen, very much. Helen, Helen, sorry, can you go, can you make it full screen? We're just seeing the little like the outline. It is full screen on mine. Oh, weird. <laughs> uh, it is full screen on mine. I mean, I can just not use the PowerPoint if it helps. No, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. It's just that's funny. What can you? What could you? What are you seeing then? I I see like it's very small. It's only about. You can see the yeah. You can first see the first three slides on the left. It's almost like it's in edit mode. Yeah. Yeah. No, mine is. It's absolutely full pre presentation mode. That's so. Hmm. Weird. That's weird. Okay. Let me just stop share and then see if I go in again. You know, technology is all it's amazing until it just doesn't work. <laughs> I know. Right. And I can edit this out of the um yeah, no, that's fine. Uh zoom share screen. I'll just give it another go. Is that that's better. It's at least moved. It's still in edit mode, though. It's like, I can see slide four, five, and six now. Weird. Isn't that bizarre? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in full screen mode. So. Oh, well. Okay, just go do your best. <laughs> yeah. Go back okay. up to the top, though, because we can't, now we can't see the first. I don't thing. think it's moving. It's like sending a screen capture. I don't think it'll let her move. I don't, I don't think it's a, I think it's a screen capture. It's weird. So what are you seeing now? Are you seeing Andrew with three bullet points? Don't see Andrew. No, see slide no. four, five, and six. Okay, I'm going to come out and just talk to you then. Okay. <laughs> I think that would be easy. Oh, that, hey, it moved there. You, you slid it. I saw your mouse go across the screen there. That's interesting. I can see your mouse. <laughs> oh, I can that's see. Good. Oh, 
<laughs> I can I can see Andrew now. You've made it big. Yeah, but it's not presentation mode. No. No. So I can carry on yeah. like this if you like. Ah, uh, it's up to you. Or whatever. Yeah. So I'll I'll talk to you about Andrew. Um, because his his problems are um you know manifestly overwhelming for him. So he's forty two years old. He's got three teenage kids. Recently divorced. Um, but is living in one room rented accommodation, so doesn't have the facility to be a proper father to his children because they can't stay with him when, they, when they'd when they like to. He's a carpenter, he's lost his driving license um, and therefore his job, so he can't afford child maintenance, so his wife is very, very angry um, and is feeling unsupported. He's remote from his family, they're geographically removed. So he's got this whole range of emotions and he's often in a heightened emotional state. So he's reduced functioning, feels very lonely and really can't um, access the support services he needs because everything is just too much for him. Um, and he, you know, his challenges are huge. He's, he's got the pressure of teleological time. He's got the emotions that, that come to play. He doesn't have any space actually where somebody will sit down with him and talk to him about what really matters to him. So every single interaction he has with his clinical team is all about his treatment, you know, or looking at a patient concern inventory, which all that's doing is reinforcing with Andrew what his problems are. So nobody's actually sitting down and saying, what really matters to you? What's important that you get right in the time you have left? How do you want to be with your loved ones? Where's your team around you? How can we help you build that? Um, so I think, you know, our role is about trying to get everybody to shift from what does the average patient need to know to what is what are the particular concerns of this patient that will enable them? Hi, Teresa. That oh. will, en will enable them to be a person who is having their best possible day, no matter where they are on their brain tumor journey. Um, and that's, that's how we work as a charity. So we work um, to close this gap with patients, with caregivers and their clinical team, and we help them build um, a team around them. I'm gonna skim over the facts because you, you know this. So I'll just talk a little bit about what we do. So um, very much our whole service, service is based on a coaching model. We have support specialists that are dotted around the UK. Um, their role, we they're highly qualified coaches. If they're not trained when they come to us, then we train them. But their role is to grow a community on the ground, which is something I think we, we have the ability to do in the UK because we're such a small country. So we've got somebody, for example, who's based in London and the Southeast. So, so that service in London and the Southeast would be very different to the service in Scotland, where we've got people who are very geograph geographically removed. Um, who would have to travel a long way and therefore can't meet people face to face. Whereas in London, it's very easy to get, you know, 25 or 50 people who are living with a brain tumour together in a restaurant for a meetup, for example. So what we find is that coaching helps people, whether it's a patient or a caregiver, who is living with a brain tumour, come to terms with their new reality. And it's it, it assumes that they're not a deficit model. So, you know, that they do have resources. It's just at the point that they're at, they've lost sight of how they can utilize those resources. So what we do is we use coaching to help them take control of their care. So they're not in service to their diagnosis. So they don't feel it's owning them and driving them. Um, and that enables them to have their best possible day every day. Even at end of life care with the right coaching conversations, you can plan to make sure that everybody has everything they need. And so for us, it means it's a really good tool because it means we're closer to our, our users. So the stakeholders that use our service, it creates a more meaningful dialogue of every touch point. So every time we engage with our community, um, that we know that dialogue is purposeful and is focused around their needs. It creates clarity and it brings purpose for people living with a brain tumor. But for me, running the charity, it also means that we've got a structured framework with which my support specialists work. So I know the quality of conversations that they're having are good. I know what tools they're using um, to elicit the, the key values and what's important to people. So we ask lots and lots of questions, um, but not questions like, are you OK? Or, you know, what's stopping you dealing with this? Or how are you? So instead, you know, we might ask things like right now at this moment, how are you? 
can you can you remember a time when you were feeling strong what are you struggling with the most and that's probably the question we ask the most um, who can help you how do you want to be in the, the weeks and months ahead what do you want to achieve what's important to you so we use coaching to create shift um, and what we find is it helps people to feel better able to face the things and they're better feel more able and and resilient so we do a lot of focused conversations around what are the facts so what do you know about your diagnosis and these are the four stages of awareness that shift the scope of a conversation from individual reflection to shared insight so you know what's happened tell me what you know and then the emotive responses if you can elicit those um, the, so the feelings what do you spend your time thinking about um, how does it make you feel what are the things that make you feel out of control with your emotions and then looking at their interpretation. So where are the, where the, and this is the really important bit of the conversation, because this is where the deep grappling is done to find the meaning, you know, so what's this all about? Um, what are our insights from this? What are you learning from this conversation? And then what does it mean for you? So you go to the decision. So what are the implications and the decisions? Um, what do you want to discuss? What are the next steps? So we would very rarely ask a why question because it always puts people on the defensive and we always try and reframe the question as a what or a how question. Um, these are just some quotes. So uh, first stop is we've got our website. So please feel free to have a look around our website. When we started way back in 2006, so we've been around for 15 years, we were the only brain tumour charity that actually focused on the, the patient caregiver support. The other charities that existed all focused on funding um, lab based research. Um, and as I said, we didn't want people to feel as lost as we did the day we were told our daughter had a brain tumour. So that's why we're very, very much focused on the patient and caregiver. So please have a look around our website. We've got loads of resources. Most, I think all of them actually are downloadable, but you know, we'll happily pop some in a post. We can't send brain boxes, the big box um, abroad because they just cost too much. But things like our radiotherapy book, we've got a great book on um, how to manage behavior and personality change. We've got one on how to manage fatigue. So it talks a little bit about, or quite a lot about the science um, and the clinical input behind fatigue or why there are, you can see it in the, the picture there, um, why there are behavior and personality changes, and then gives you some practical things that you could do either as a caregiver or a patient. And then the, the introduction diagnosis, receiving diagnosis after biopsy, those eight booklets all reflect the national service guidelines that we have in the UK. So whilst they're not um, US based, there may be, you know, we've got things in there like um, when you're in survivorship mode, what are the key questions that you might want to focus on when you're working with your clinical team? And we appreciate that not every, not every brain tumour takes you through to palliative and end of life care. So if you're living with a non-malignant meningioma, for example, you might only be interested in the first six. So that's why we've done them in different booklets. And we also have another series about proton beam therapy too, which is much more available in the States than it is in, in the UK. So those are our kind of hard copy, tangible resources that you can pick up. Um, and as I say, you know, if you don't want to download them, I'll, I'll happily pop just to set in, in the post to you hard copy. Our lovely Charlotte can get them out, but I will need your addresses. And then our online support. So um, with COVID, and I expect it was the same for you in the, the States, we had to very quickly, we moved within 48 hours to doing something actually we'd always intended to doing, and that was putting our support online. Up until that point, we'd had a lot of physical meetings where people could meet in a social space. We, um, they were called our meetups. We had no agenda. Um, people would just get together and talk about anything. And it didn't have to be about their brain tumor. But since then we've had, we've got a massive program of events um, and they tend to fall into three categories. So we have our meetups, which people just get together in a virtual room. So we like got our teens virtual meetup, um, our meningioma matter virtual meetup, um, which are brain tumor specific. Um, we've got the GBM virtual meetup. And you're more than welcome to join these. I can send you links to them. And then um, we've got 
more clinically focused ones as well. Um, so we get, because we've got such a great network of clinicians, um, we've got one, for example, a, a researcher, Dr. Wai Lu, who does one on cannabinoids explained. So he's done some research around the impact of cannabinoids on living with brain tumor. We had one last week where we had a neuro-oncologist and a neurosurgeon talking about the challenges of treating a meningioma. We've had a neuro-oncologist talking about the decisions that come into play when you're looking at a, living with a low grade. Um, we've got one a neurosurgeon who's going to be talking about the latest advances in neurosurgery and the different technologies that are used in that. And then we've got another set of another tier of webinars which are more coaching based. So how to deal with the overwhelm, how to manage fatigue. We've got some health and well-being ones. So we've got, you know, calmness and connectivity. Um, we've got a positive communication workshop. We've got things like art time. So there's a, um, we've got a fabulous artist who comes along and you can just paint and draw in real time with Maddie and the group as well. So a whole range um, and you'll find those on our website under Eventbrite. And then impact, we're just putting together the 2021, 20 to 21 impact. Um, but we found that running out, putting all of our support online, we've attracted a whole new range of, of people. Um, about 50% of attendees are new to our service, um, over 100,000. I'm probably thinking these figures probably seem quite small to you in the States because <laughs> you're such a big country. No, no, this, this is um, this is impressive because we I think it's it's a big country, but it's, uh, you know, especially with just GBM specific, it's a very, very small group of people. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, uh, you know, we we didn't stop um, for COVID-19. Obviously, we kept our we kept our doors open. We kept the lights on, um, but it's been um a really interesting experience for us and today we had a meeting about what's it going to look like when we go back out there and we could do physical meetings and what we found is that our community is really hankering to meet up with physically with people again so we've just organized our first picnic on the lawn for late june in one of one of our towns where we've got quite a good community so we're finding that covid actually despite the fact that people might feel compromised with their immune systems actually they do want to get out there and get meeting people again um yeah, so these are these are just some some sound bites. Um, I'm sure you'll recognise some of the resonances about em emotion here, um, and not being in service to your tumour. You know, just living the life that you want, and I think that's basically what we help people do. We've also got a paediatric arm. Um, lots of fun events there, um, and this was this is a little story about two year old uh, Noah. Um, so we have a, it's a little brains trust, it's called a little brains trust arm too. So that's us in a nutshell. I'm going to shut up now and we can just have a chat if you like. I'll come out of the screen share. Thank you, Helen. That was, um, that was excellent.